Okay, call a meeting to order Waitley Select Board of uh, July 15th, 2020. First item on the agenda is to approve minutes of June 24th and June 29th. Um, I would make a motion that we uh, accept the minutes. I'll second that. Any discussion? No? Nothing for me. Joyce? Uh, aye. Fred, yes. Okay. Vendor payroll warrants. Any question, comments? I'm good. Okay, moving on. Public comment. Anybody public? Uh, is anything to say that on items not listed on the agenda? Um, Fred, I received one comment. Um, if you don't mind, I'll just read it. Sure. Um, it is from Dan Dennehy, and it's a suggestion for potential public comment at the next select board meeting. I would suggest a survey of West Whateley residents to see if they have any desire for the town to pursue cell tower funding for their area. And that's sent in relation to, I don't, I, have, I haven't researched this at all, but said Senator, Senator Hines and Common Friend are working on a $10 million state bond for cell phone service in rural parts of the state, including Franklin County. So I would just wanted to share that with you. Is there a part of our town that doesn't have cell tower service? There are parts yeah. where the signal's really weak. Like where I live, it's some days it's good, some days it's not. Um, sometimes I can, can make phone calls from my home on my cell phone but probably two thirds of the time I can't. Two thirds you can? Right, yeah, just, you know, depends on the, you know, I imagine that sometimes on that cell tower that's not that far away and pretty close to line of sight, maybe some of those <coughs> antennas aren't pointing to the west because they're really trying to serve uh, I-90, sorry, uh, I-91. Yeah. So, um, the western part of the town gets really crappy cell service. You know, it's very iffy, um, and often you can when you need it. Of course, that's when you notice that you can't get it. Okay. Don't we have a, a committee or, or a cable advisory committee or some kind of committee that one time looked at cell towers or? Cable advisory committee doesn't work on cell phone towers. Um, I, what's the thing with the, with cell towers, I guess, to get more to Dan's point is, um, it's certainly a piece of infrastructure that many people would want. Then the question becomes, where do you place it? Do we have a good location for it that would actually serve everyone and would not have a lot of objections from the abutters because they look, you know, oh, so lovely. Yeah. I can just intervene real quick on that. Um, all I can tell you, Fred, definitely West Waitley is horrible for cell phone service. Um, but the one thing that I don't know what can be done is the town already is permit, per, the ZBA already permitted a company to put a tower off of Haydenville Road on a private property resident, and then the company has yet to build it. But that's probably three to five years ago. So we already have a plan in progress and it's already been permitted to do it but they never come they never did it mm. oh, okay. i wonder if they're eligible for these kinds of funds like if the thing is keeping them from doing it is financial and these funds might be able to make the project go forward maybe that's something we can let them know yeah, I'm sure they're at the point where companies are looking at cost benefit ratios. And when you get into the rural areas, naturally, there's just not enough customers, they feel probably to, to warrant the expense on putting the tower in. Okay. What, what's the one off of Masterson Road? Is that a private one? Yes. Uh, That's not, that is not a cell tower. It's a ham, that's a ham operate, ham radio operation. Oh, okay. What if I reach out to Senator Comerford and just let them know that there's one that's permitted but hasn't been constructed yet? 
and see where we go from there. Okay, I guess that that sounds good to me. That seems reasonable. Okay. Okay. You might want to also talk, Brian, talk to the landowner that has the that lease in place to see where if it's still viable and valid too. Right. Do you remember the last name? Korpieski. Okay. Okay, anything else on public comments? Oh. Okay, moving on, uh, scheduled appointments. We're almost on, on schedule here, 610 from uh, Debilitating Medical Conditions Treatment Center to discuss and consider entering into host community agreement for a tier 11 marijuana cultivation establishment to be located at Seven River Road. So, um, I think the best way to go about this is maybe for the folks from EMCTC to introduce themselves, maybe give a, a quick overview of the project. Um, and then we can talk, Joyce and I can, can talk a little bit more about the, the host community agreement that we've been discussing with them. Does that sound good, Fred? Enjoy. Okay, yes, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, sure. sounds good. So uh, this is DMCTC. I'm Jared Glansberger. With us is Blake Mensing, our council, uh, Sam Hanmer, our managing member, and John Hanmer. Um, so we have a lease in place with Seven River Road in Waitley, uh, and we intend to um, have a cultivation facility there of up to 100,000 square feet of canopy. Uh, we conducted our community outreach meeting, I think, on the 15th of June at 6 p.m. Um, there didn't seem to be, uh, or there were none, uh, substantial opposition raised by local residents to the proposal. Um, we submitted a draft host community agreement to Brian um, and to the select board. Um, and so we're, we're um, open and uh, hopeful that uh, we can receive your comments and um, make progress on on the agreement. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna put up the site plan that you signed if you just wanna talk about it a little bit. Sure. Let me zoom in a little bit. Ah, wonderful. Yep, so this is the site plan um, that we presented uh, at the June 15th um, virtual web-based community outreach meeting. Um, it was put together by Berkshire Design Group, um, by Chris Chamberlain specifically, um, who we understand has uh, worked with the town on permitting other projects in town. Um, what you'll see there is the available space. Um, we intend to start with um, 45,000 square feet of greenhouse, which is that um, set of rectangles there that's carved out uh, from the uh, kind of grayed out space. Um, the grade space is additional uh, land we may use, um, but our, um, you know, our, our intention is to put up uh, approximately 45,000 square feet of uh, greenhouse in that area. You can see that there's um, parking um, already identified um, inside the perimeter of what will be the kind of restricted area. Um, we intend to have uh, security fencing and other security measures that meet um, state standards. Um, we, we'll, uh, of course, submit those plans and uh, hope to receive approval from town police and fire. Um, we'll have a guards gate uh, towards the entrance of the building um, and surveillance. Um, uh, we're recognizing, you'll see that um, the start of the kind of grayed out area is 400 feet back from the public way. Um, so that's acknowledging the AR1 versus AR2 um, zoning distinction there and the 50 foot setbacks uh, on all sides from uh, neighboring properties there. Um, so we um, are contemplating doing both um, uh, outdoor uh, cultivation and cultivation in the greenhouses. And so the grade area is where we may uh, do the outdoor cultivation. Um, per 
town bylaws, we intend to put the outdoor cultivation towards the back of the property, and we believe we have um, sufficient space in those um, back lots um, to, to, to do that. Um, and so that would, um, you know, that's, that's for the purposes of avoiding, um, you know, uh, uh, odor spilling over um, and adhering to the state, uh, to the town uh, bylaws. Um, what else? We have an existing shed, uh, a barn rather, that's, um, that's uh, within the setback. So we do not intend to use that for um, a restricted cannabis purpose. Um, there's also an existing house uh, on the property um, where our uh, manager, our cultivation manager, John, um, will likely reside. Um, so one of our team members will, will very actively be a community member um, as well as uh, managing the site um, and uh, reinforcing security on, on the premises. Um, so the, um, going back to security, the, uh, the cameras that we'll have installed, um, which are uh, required by, by state, um, will work with the town police um, to provide a live feed um, to, those, um, to those security cameras. Um, and you know, we'll, we'll actively work with them to ensure um, that the site is, is secure. So maybe I'll stop there and see if there are questions. If I may, I did have one point of clarification. Uh, it is in the host community agreement. I just wanted to highlight, and again, this is attorney Blake Mensing. Um, the 100,000 square foot canopy cap um, would be made up of a combination of medical canopy and adult use canopy. Uh, of course, the plants don't know for what purpose they're grown. The state does, uh, so there'd be separate license requirements. Um, so we included that language in the draft host community agreement um, just to indicate that the, the total maximum allowed under state law uh, in terms of any combination uh, of medical and adult use is 100,000 square feet. Uh, and that's, you know, we, we'll, we'll never exceed that. So I just want to make that distinction. Thanks, Blake. So what is, what is the area in front of the proposed Greenhouses, I guess. The shaded gray, what is that? Uh, the total square footage? This part here? Yeah, what is that? I can't read the writing oh, on it. Cu currently, you mean? Or, or in the future, what is that going to be? Um, it could be, I mean, it's zoned appropriately for uh, cannabis cultivation. So it says outdoor, potential outdoor cultivation is what that says. Correct. And if okay. we, and we could use it for potential outdoor cultivation, we may in the future wish to expand our greenhouse footprint. Um, and so that's likely, uh, you know, a, a likely spot on the, uh, on the premises that we would expand our, our greenhouse to. And I would also like to just add uh, that in light of the state's Global Warming Solutions Act, uh, the commission has actually prioritized uh, outdoor grows in the form of slightly faster review uh, and lesser application fees and annual fees. Um, so really this, this facility as proposed, you know, a combination of, of outdoor and greenhouse would be really at the, at the cutting edge of uh, sustainability practices for cannabis. Um, most of these grows occur in retrofitted warehouses or old mill buildings. Uh, and of course, if you can't use the sun, you have to supplement that with electricity. Um, so that's another uh, added benefit. Thanks, Mike. So is, is this parcel all open land other than, other than the wetlands or is there trees and vegetation or what's so the there? wet The wetlands, um, so the kind of dotted blue areas uh, towards the back part of the parcel. Yeah, thank you, Brian. Yeah, exactly. Um, so that's a tree line. Um, it's both a tree line and designated as wetlands that are not currently under agricultural use. The rest of the property is under agricultural use currently. So those are the, that's the only trees on the, on the property currently. And then to the back of the property, there are, are yet more trees. And Fred, they would still need to go through the special permit process and the site plan approval process right. with the ZBA and planning board. And presumably you guys haven't been to conservation yet, right? No, we, we haven't. And so um, what, that's our next kind of port of call is to do uh, the CONSCOM presentation um, where we'll have uh, Chris Chamberlain come in and, and discuss 
um, these plans or a slightly revised version of these plans. And I'll just note that I had the privilege of serving as a conservation commissioner, so I'm very familiar with the Wetlands Protection Act uh, requirements as well. So are you buying this parcel or leasing it? We're currently under a lease and have an option to purchase and we will likely execute our option to purchase within uh, the first couple of years. Okay. And if everything goes well with all permits and meetings, when are you expecting to start something here? Uh, we'd love to be operational as early as Q1 of 2021. 20, uh, okay. And by operational, I, I, I guess I mean... Uh, <laughs> can, you, can you say what a date is? Because Q1 means different things if you've got a fiscal year here, there, or sure. wherever. So, we, so to, to Brian's uh, comment, we, we uh, hope that we're, we're able to plant, or permitted to plant, I should say, um, if not actually planting, but permitted to plant um, as, as early as March of next year um, or April. Um, and then we would look to plant, you know, according to the season. And that okay. would be up. That would so be the up earliest there. would be spring of 2021. Correct. Yeah. yeah. And that, you know, that goes to what Blake was mentioning before about the state prioritizing these environmentally um, preferable approaches to cultivation. And so we would get, um, we would get, um, an expedited review by the triple C. Where else are you in the area? Do you have any other facilities? Um, yep, we have a host community agreement in Agawam um, for both processing and retail. Okay. And we're in, um, in process of identifying and leasing um, retail space uh, in the Pioneer Valley as well. Okay. So now we can go to the host community agreement. That would be great. And yeah, so, so um, so Fred, Joyce and I have reviewed this and we had a call with um, with the representatives from EMCTC um, yesterday and we, we talked about uh, various changes that, that we'd like to see to bring the agreement that they proposed really in line with what has been offered to um, the previous folks who have had post community agreements for cultivation and they were amenable to that. Um, so it, it looks very similar to what NAEP advisors was the last one that we had entered into with them. Um, there was some, some language change, um, but it, the terms are, are pretty similar to what the board yeah. previously agreed to with NAP. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure the terms themselves have really changed. There were, were some changes in words. <coughs> on a couple places. Um, to give one example um, uh, regarding the, there was one place where they were talking about, they just added in what chapter and verse of Massachusetts law it was referring to, right? Um, so, I mean, we have to obey Massachusetts law whether it's in our host community agreement or not. <laughs> so, <clears throat> I mean, that's the kind of thing that's different. Um, in it, and of course, it doesn't say NAP advisors anymore. At least, if it does, I didn't catch any place where it didn't get subbed out. I guess the other thing that is different is that your your uh, outreach meeting was a virtual Correct. outreach meeting just yep. because of the time. Correct. Um, there was also a reference to the to the coronavirus as well uh, as a potential source of delay. So again, that, yes, yes, that's right. So I, I, not, nothing that is, I would say, a, a variation from what the, we would think of as the terms. There's some, we have some flexibility on um, extending a deadline because of coronavirus related things that otherwise it was written in the kind of hard and fast. So I, I you know, and so just, I wanted to give Fred some idea 
of what we mean by it's not exactly the same it's a little different but i wouldn't say that the terms are um, anything that other people who've already signed their agreements would call oh that's unfair that they get this and we didn't and so on the substance is the same that the edges have been smoothed over over to address the current yeah. you know, reality so yeah thank you Okay. So what do we need to do, Brian? We need to approve this agreement, a motion to approve the, the agreement. Okay. Uh, yep. yeah. Was that a motion I heard? I'll make a motion to approve the agreement. Uh, I'll second that. Okay. Further discussion? Okay. We'll call vote. Joyce? Aye. Fred, yes. So who needs to sign this? Do all three of us or do I, Mr. Chair? Or? All three names are at the bottom, so I think. Okay. Yeah. So we'll have this, we'll have this available for you guys to sign. Okay. Uh, okay. You can stop by the offices. And can you guys, can you guys send over the host community agreement certification form too? Precisely what I was going to ask about. Yes, absolutely. We've done a lot of these where we've forgotten that. So okay. I'd rather have these guys come over once. <laughs> okay. We'll get that over to you. Okay. Anything else you want to share with us uh, before we move on? We look forward to operating in town. What is, uh, what do you guys think for your next step in terms of boards and committees? Is it Conscom planning? Conscom. EBA? Yep. Yep. Conscom is our next stop. Um, and you know we'll we'll listen to uh, Chris Chamberlain, who's been through this uh, process before successfully, and and we'll just take his advice. Yep. Okay. Thanks very well, much, Lord. We appreciate it. All okay. Right. Thank you. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Working with you guys. Thank you. Okay, thank Good evening. You. Take care. Okay. Mo moving on the agenda. Uh, our next item was. Uh, discussion with the chief of police and uh, here he's he's not available this evening brian is that correct right so i mean i don't know if you guys want to cover quickly have a quick conversation or we could just move it to the to the next I meeting feel, i feel like one of the reasons we're having this meeting tonight is because we were we needed like a couple meetings to talk about this within our our deadline I feel like if Jim couldn't show up, we need an extension on our deadline because I think we need to discuss it with him. Yeah. And then so we need kind of a second chance. I think in the meeting materials, there's a, um, and I'm scrolling through the meeting materials now to find um, the, the right place. Where is it? You're, you're talking of the Policing strategies in the employment agreement. Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, that I uh, I I feel like it would not be that big a deal for um, for Jim to do that to you know give us you know, if we need to you know presumably he'll be here at the next meeting if he's not we just make whatever crazy demands we want right <laughs> just kidding <laughs> but I, I I feel like that's a um, and I was a little disappointed when I heard he couldn't make this meeting on account of we had gone to a lot of trouble to have uh, two meetings within the time period of the 30 days with the, of the start of his contract. So, um, so there's, so there's that. At, um, where is it? Yeah. So he's got, it's just sort of got like a one page thing. And I think we had something substantially longer before. And I haven't had time since we got this to really take a look at what's in here and what has been in there before and make the comparison. So I don't feel like we're that well, you know, I, I'm not really that ready to discuss it because I've been just fixating on the fact that Jim has stood me up. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask you. What, what was the difference between what we had last time? So, Yeah, it, it seems like there's a substantial amount of, at least text taken out. Um, and it might be that, I mean, just with the fact that we've got to do so many of our meetings online, 
it might change something about the community outreach program, certainly for the coming one to two years that he, we may need to be more creative because I think a lot of the outreach he was doing were things where he would go to, I don't know, a Grange meeting or he'd go to some, you know, have a meeting where the topic was, you know, telephone fraud and how to avoid it. And that's got to kind of be done a little differently, right? But uh, I think we definitely want to be ready for a good discussion and, um, and if we ends up going into August, so be it. Well, or in the next two weeks, I guess, for our next meeting. Right, we can also, yeah, but, but when we do that, we sort of, I don't think at the end of next meeting, we're going to have a conclusive document. <clears throat> we may have something where we say, well, this is kind of what we want, and let's go back and, you know, rewrite it and think, and maybe really approve it two weeks after that, or whenever our meeting in August is. Okay, and this, the second part of meeting with him was to talk about the a policy for timely payment of uh, police uh, detail officers and we police can, detail. I think uh, we can table that. Yeah, we can table that till next time too. Two weeks is going to make a difference on that. And I think somewhere we saw two two examples that he pulled out from other communities. Uh, I, I, found, I guess, yeah, I found those. If he's got others, I guess I'd like to see or, or know of others that have, that have done it. I, I think them two are well, just a very, very few, yeah. I guess, examples. Yeah. I, I guess to me, the relevant question is, um, if this is a really small amount of cash flow that we would be basically supporting, I mean, in a way, we're just the entity through which they get their paychecks, right? It doesn't cost us money. Uh, we get a little administrative fee off of it, but we're doing some administration, right? Um, and in, in a way, it's like, well, either, you know, these people don't always pay on time. Uh, it sort of puts it on us then to do the collection if they don't pay, right? It's not on the officers or it's not on the police. So those are the kind of questions I wanted to ask him about was like, if we do this, to what extent is the town taking on uh, the financial risk right. of having to either chase down people who don't pay um, or like what, how big is the cash flow? I suspect the cash flow might not be that big, but I don't know. So those kind of questions might be relevant, I think. Right. Okay. okay. I think he has that information. Well, and I think Jim is, Jim or Don are the one that chased down the detail payments currently. Hmm. Um, yeah. Yeah, I know that there were some that we like we just never ever got like 10 years later we still never got it. So what do we do in a case like that when we don't get paid but we've already paid the officer? That's, that's right the risk of non-payment is shifted. But. Yeah, the risk of non-payment falls on us then. Yeah. One thing comes to mind thinking about this if these officers are not Whiteley police does that make a difference? I mean they, I guess they have to wait like the Whaley police, but are we going to pay, say, Hatfield police that come on, on duty in Whaley within whatever time period? Are we going to extend this to anybody, any police that comes here to do the duty work? And I, I don't, I don't know, know what extent that happens, whether that happens or not, but. All good questions. Yeah. Well, then maybe we table this and ask those questions when Jim can be here to answer them. All right. Okay. Moving on to the COVID-19 state of emergency. We've got two, two directives here on employees working and reopening buildings. Do we need any discussion on these, uh, Brian? Um, I don't believe we do at this time. I think things are pretty stable in town. Um, we, the Board of Health is getting some complaints about um, people at Hurley Field um, in terms of not, not following social distancing or and or wearing masks when you can't follow social distancing. And they're trying to deal with those as they come up. I, I think on some level, every, every town is dealing with this, every local Board of Health is dealing with it because they're the, they're the enforcement agents and um, they're doing, they're doing a lot of work, um, for very little pay. So 
Um, yeah, and had, yeah. had they made a request regarding Hurley that we should do, you know, change its status in any way? No, okay. No. Because no. I would respect that. You know, if they did, I would definitely con consider what I, if they have a suggestion about how to, um, how to improve that. Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of it is they rely on people to do the right thing. And yeah. sometimes it doesn't always happen. Okay. But I'll follow up with Fran. Okay, moving on. Next item under old business. Uh, discuss the results of the vehicle speed studies on Haydenville Road, Chestnut Plain Road, and River Road. I guess we've seen some, th some comments, I guess, from the chief, but not really anything that's anything that uh, conclusive yet. Right. I, I think I think we should maybe table this as well and, and have a conversation about about next steps and how we want to use yeah. and how we want to use the information that we have. Right. Yeah. Okay. The one comment I would make is that I I see when they did um, uh, Chestnut Plain Road, they did it in between Haydenville Road and Christian Lane. Is did I read that right? Yes, that's, I think that's it, yeah. That's not where, well, it might be that the residents there would disagree with this statement, but that's not where I see people going really fast. The complaints we've gotten are sort of from this, the southern part, before you get into town, that people are whipping through there. And then you get, there's that hill that gets you up into town and there's a speed limit sign. And then of course people slow down there a bit. I'm not saying they get down to the speed limit, yeah. but the complaints I had heard were from Chestnut Plain Road, and it just doesn't see, it seems like that one's just, it's right around the corner from the other one. And everybody approaching there has something else causing them to slow down. So I'm not sure the speed information for the Chestnut Plain Road one is, um, I mean, it's, it's, I'm sure it's accurate for the location where it was put, yeah. but uh, it wouldn't help us probably to find the egregious uh, violators there. And, um, I really thought that when they said Chestnut Plain Road, they were talking further south than Haydenville Road. So if we do this again, if we could try to remember uh, in the years to come to try and put one uh, kind of further south, just outside of town. Um, and that might give us new information. We should not be putting these in the same place and certainly not, you know, in the place is just around the corner from the other place, you know, that's, um, that's my rant. Okay. Unless there's been one done there a few years ago, I, I don't know. I don't know the last time. I don't think I've ever seen one done down there. Or Cog did a, did a speed study or even a, a traffic traffic count on Christian Lane. Do you know, Keith, if anything else been done? On, I mean, on Chestnut Plane? Have they done counts before? Or? I don't. I'd have to go into my files to see if they've done, how far south they've done on Chestnut Plain. Yeah. Okay. Could I, could I ask uh, what the speed limit is in the center of town? It anywhere um, is drops down to 25 as you get into the intersection of Christian Lane and then goes to 30, I believe it is in the through the center. All right. Okay. Yeah, we can put that on a, a future meeting because I, I guess I have some thoughts of what we should be doing with this information and, and what the yeah. chief... Yeah, I know where I want our police officers to be at uh, 4 o'clock between 4 and 4.30. <laughs> it's just it's real clear pattern in the timing of what they call... Uh, oh, what, did they, what was their term for it? They had a really nice sort of sanitized... Um, enforceable violations yeah and um and the other uh, <laughs> in a way like a funny not, not really a funny number but they give you like the maximum speed that they recorded during that what was it two weeks um that somebody was going 76 miles an hour on river road i mean 76 that's like that's speeding if you're on 91 Right. Um, there's no, I mean, I, 
uh, the River Road one, I, I would like to say it surprised me, but it didn't because I know that that's a, a place. We'll just, we'll do just that. Plane just <laughs> just plane a plain road, even if it's the center of town, there's 68. Somebody went 68 to the center of town. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I, I don't know if that's like, could, could that be errant data? Um, and I guess it wasn't quite as bad on, uh, on well, on Haydenville it was 71. So I, I guess the, uh, another question in the back of my mind is, is that real? I mean, I, I, so, I almost believe it on River Road <laughs> because it's so long and so open and there's not that much traffic on it at certain times of day. But 78, that's pretty fast. Even if that's just the, you know, that's just the highest one that we saw. But, the, uh, but that's, that's by Hurley Park. So, you know, that's open country, open road. So, that, yeah. I don't know the, the times. I, I looked at the date. I don't know what, what time of day that was, whether that was at midnight or uh, it couldn't be an evening, yeah. hours with not much traffic and people just. It was not, yeah, it was not easy to figure out from what they gave us. When did that 78 mile an hour one happen? I mean, and as a scientist, I would look at that data point and I'd say, like, could there be a measurement problem there? That's the other one is when you get things that are way, way out like that. Um, but it does seem to just say that, you know, the, the vast majority, like the 85th percentile speed for, uh, I'm looking at the Haydenville Road one, was 48. And the speed limit is 40. So, yeah, yeah, those ones are kind of high. If I go to the next one, which was, I'm scrolling through here. Um, the next one, which was the Chestnut Plain Road, the 85th percentile speed was 39. Well, that's in a 30 mile an hour zone. So it's kind of the same, like everybody's doing the same eight to 10 over the speed okay. limit. Um, uh, however, um, I think one, somebody told me one of these speed limits was wrong. It was really 45 instead of 40, but- uh, River, River Road. The River Road one. Uh, well, if the river, it says here 40, but say it's really 45. Well, the 85th percentile speed is 45. It means 85% of the people going by are going 45 or less. So it's really, it's that top 15% that are, that are making everybody crazy. And as well they should, I suppose. But anyway, I, 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 I strove through it, but I couldn't, for example, when did that 76 mile an hour person go by? Was that at 4.30 in the afternoon? I don't know. I, don't, I, don't, I guess there's all these questions that maybe no. we'll wait for the, the chief to come on our uh, future meeting and we can ask him yeah. and, and look into this and get yeah. back to us and see how he's going to handle this information. Right. So. right. Right. Can I ask that a question, was... folks? I'm sorry, I'm, I'm interrupting you. Um, I don't know if you're done with the speed question. Just a quick question back to the coronavirus concerns and precautions that people are taking. It's up to Fred if you can. If you sure. can. Yeah. Go ahead, sir. Yes. I'm allowed to go back. Thanks. So at the transfer station, the man, uh, the gentleman who manages the transfer station told me recently that um, most people observe the mask on when they're doing their dumping of trash right. and recycling, but he had one fellow who came and no mask and he offered him a mask and said, no, I don't, I don't want the mask. And he's uh, the manager, um, I forgot his name. Uh, he's fastidious about keeping a mask on the whole time he's working. It seems unfair that it wouldn't be a requirement there that anybody who's gonna be coming within a few feet of him, whatever, and that's close quarters there, that that wouldn't be a requirement at the transfer station. I believe it is a requirement. It is. It is. But some people can just ignore it, right? I mean, a requirement in, it's not enforced. We don't have a great enforcement mechanism, but it is a requirement. At least they're right around the corner. Yeah. <laughs> and, and well, I, in that moment, what, could you have a suggestion what to do in that moment? Well, I, I think, you know, the person needs to be called out. It's unfair to, especially to the person who's there all day long. Yeah. It's oh, I, I completely agree with you. Um, uh, no, I don't really know how it should be handled, but person mm -hmm. should be eldered at least. And, you know, 
asked for a reason why he feels he shouldn't uh, give protection to everybody he's coming in contact with. Mm -hmm. mm. I don't know. I, I'm, I'm raising well, then, it without that. Without yeah, right. Okay. Yeah. I, I, we can look, we can ask the, uh, the manager there and, and maybe the signs saying wearing masks is not clearly visible. I, I, I don't know. I've been there and I, I don't, I don't remember. Yeah. Uh, but maybe we should ask them if people don't adhere to that, to take down their name and number or license plate number. I guess for information, and we can decide what we want to do with that. Yeah, yeah. If that person keeps coming back week after week, well, then I, I guess maybe we can take some action yeah. on it or some contact with them yeah. uh, directly. But I, I, I want the Board of Health would have some advice as well. Sure. Mostly, th mostly thinking. I mean, it's it's anybody who passes by somebody who um, disdains the mask, but. I was mostly thinking of the guy who's there all day long. Oh yeah, yeah, he, yeah. He is compromised. That's why he, he's religious about we're, you know wearing the mask. But anyhow, sorry to interrupt. Uh, no, that's that's fine. Uh, Gabe, you're you're here for the uh, Poplar Hill Road project. Yes. And uh, Keith, uh, are we expecting anybody else for that? Because I, I guess I could jump to that agenda item if to, we don't have to keep a. Uh, Gabriel, Mr. Cooney here on for the rest of our meeting. Gabe is fine. Keith. All I can tell you is um, that, you know, certainly Gabe was invited and Peter Chrissy was invited. I'm not sure if Peter will be attending. I know he sent an email back, which I forwarded on to Brian. Brian, you got that, correct? Yeah. Okay, so... I would say if you want to start with that, Fred, and jump around to it, we can take care of it now. It's fine. Okay. Brian, could you kind of summarize what he said in that email for us? Um, yeah, give me a second to pull it up. Okay. And by the way, Joyce, it was at, I looked, it was at 4 a.m. Oh, <laughs> Thank you. I couldn't find that in the uh, in the data. Okay. Um, I'll just I'll just read it. It says this was written to Keith. Um, we wish to thank you for your courtesy and professionalism as you navigate changes to a scenic road. The proposed road width at 20 feet seems like the best solution, as a narrower way would become challenging in the winter. We realize that this may be an abrupt aesthetic change from the present somewhat overgrown borders, but it will probably seem normal in a short while. Lastly, a paved road at a two-way width will hopefully allow the eventual addition of speed signs appropriate to the dead-end academic nature of the upper end of Poplar Hill Road. Once again, we appreciate all that you and the select board are doing to improve and maintain West Waitley. Sincerely, Peter Creasy and Eleanor Murphy. Ryan, could you repeat the phrase about signs? I, I didn't quite catch that. Will hopefully allow the eventual addition of speed signs appropriate to the dead end and academic nature of the upper end of Poplar Hill Road. And my understanding of what he's referring to is that, and Keith can probably correct me if I'm wrong, that you can't post a gravel road correct. For, speed, for, for speed signs. And the, the reason they, that Mass DOT goes with that is because they consider the surface to have much more variables as far as m whether it's muddy, icy, it's, it's not a consistent necessarily surface that a paved road is. So a paved road will, the state allows you to set it the speed zone like that, but not on gravel. You'd think all those variables would argue for a, for a speed limit rather than none. But well, when it's when the road is um, perfectly graded and smooth, it has different characteristics yeah. than when it's got ruts in it. I see. What will be the speed limit once it's paved? I can't tell you. That would be they will do something similar to what was just done on the other roads where they, they take the, the raw data 
yeah. and they um, have formulas. I don't know exactly other than they need to do a speed assessment of the vehicles that are there and using it. And that information based on what the, you know, the, again, the physical characters of the road, in other words, how the, the, you know, the pavement, the curves, line of sight, things of that nature, they'll take into account when they set speed. Okay. Okay. Would it help us if we go like really slow once they're taking the data? <laughs> it probably would, but I, you know, I don't know, then I don't know. Just kidding, just kidding. Yeah, because we know, Gabe, you were the one doing that 78 on River Road at Fort yeah, I, I, I like to get up sure. early to my speeding. I like to do my speeding early. Okay, sir, did you want to make some comments for the record? No, I, I, I know I had in mind to ask Keith about the 20 versus 19, but um, if our neighbor is fine with 20, uh, you know, I, I don't want to be a fly in the ointment. I just, I guess I would have asked, um, going back to when the gravel road was widened to 18, um, that was deemed um, sufficient at the time. And is it because of paving that another two feet are important or the paving itself or? See, one of the things that the, you know, Gabe that we work with on the, on the standards is, yep. um, you know, Mass DOT recommends on this road that it, it can be 18 feet. However, when you do that, they're also saying that you should have two foot shoulders uh, on each side too. Right. Um, not, one of the things I'm trying to avoid on this whole stretch is having to worry about maintaining a gravel shoulders type of thing. Yes. Things that need to be free and clear, no mailboxes, no trees, things like that. Okay. in the shoulder area. Yeah. What I'm trying to also do is to have it so that once it gets paved, our snow plows are not needing to go off the pavement and into that gravel or grass shoulders yeah. and tear it up. And so yeah. that ultimately I think you're, you and, and Peter will be set more satisfied when we're not tearing up the shoulders. And Sounds good to me. So I, I really don't have any questions. I mean, I'm I'm, um, I'm sure there aren't any questions of me, but uh, I, um, you and I still have a chance to to meet late in the week, and that's all good. So if it's if it's 18 feet today, you're not really changing the pavement width. You're just you're just adding two feet of shoulder or paved shoulder on it. Right. Really? Yeah, it's it's probably shrunk from its 18 anyway. Um, Keith could probably confirm that, but. Yeah, the, the cra crab grass and things like that grow in and over, you yeah. know, into the gravel and... Yeah. No. All good. I was, I was up there the other day looking, looking at it. Keith, the, the stakes that are on the sides, is, is that the right-of-way line? The, the stakes that I put on the right are just, all they are doing is marking out my baseline that I established. There, that is not necessarily the right away. I tried to put them back like on the stone wall. So I mean, right. and for the most part, the stone wall or the stone wall is what we're assuming is that you know our layout. But right. Fred, I just put them where they weren't going to be intrusive to people mowing their lawns for right now. Right. Okay. And as far as the the north end, there's there's like a turnaround area. Then you go a little further, and there's a gate and a parking lot on the right. How far are you paving up to that? It would be going up that turnaround that you saw on the left. Yeah. It was, we're probably paving another hundred feet beyond that, which is still probably 75 feet to the Smith College gate. Oh, okay. That remains unpaved, that last 75 feet? Some, somewhere right in that range, yeah. yeah it, it would be back to the natural. Well, their, their parking lot is unpaved as well, right? All of that. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And you're hoping to do that this year yet? Yes. Okay. Okay, Gabe, any other comments you want to I'm make good. or questions? Nice to see you all. Thank you for the invitation.
Okay, well, thank you for joining us this evening. Thanks for coming. We don't get that much public. <laughs> the pleasure. Take care. Okay. All right. I'll be in touch, Gabe. Thank you, Keith. Okay, enjoy the rest of your evening. Okay, uh, back to our agenda. Uh, all business discuss, does, discuss, discuss and select electricity options for the town's accounts through the Whaley Community Choice Power Supply Program. Okay, Brian. Um, we got some mailings. <laughs> we have that many accounts? <laughs> yeah. So everybody knows if we don't do anything, then we get enrolled in the uh, what we selected as the default option, which is the 100% um, yeah. Texas wind, I guess it is, 100% renewable at a price that's currently cheaper than the currently cheaper than the ever source rate and the historic ever source rate. If I said that correctly. I think so. Okay. Um, so the options we have are to do nothing and be enrolled in the default and likely save money and support renewable energy. Or we could go for one of the two options or we could opt out and stay with Eversource. Although Jonathan was, wasn't able to attend tonight I spoke with him earlier and his, I guess his thought as a select board member, because I'm not sure that the energy committee actually discussed it, is that that the town would, would do the default, but he's not here to vote. So. <laughs> and, and actually I'm most comfortable with that myself because it's our best chance at lowering our electricity costs. And while as an individual, I might opt for one of the uh, other options that support, you know, the higher price ones that support local solar, uh, local renewables production in Massachusetts, I don't feel like I can impose that on everybody else. You know, so, I, I, so it's, it's probably not, I probably will opt for one of the ones that help promote more local renewables in Massachusetts. I think the best one for the town is the default option and uh, because it, it saves us money and we use, you know, our electricity goes up and down uh, with the, with, um, with the Eversource and this will bring us both stability and we can plan our costs better, so. Okay. Uh, I, I guess I, I asked a question at the last meeting that they had, and I was told to try calling the Colonial Power, and I did. I didn't get an answer yet. My question was, if you pick the option today, and come January, you decide you want to change options, can you do that? Or do you have to opt out of the program and then ask them to be back in so you can pick another option? Hold on, I'll, I'll ask someone who might know the answer. I'll be right back. I, I never got an answer. Danny? Because it, it might be, say people today pick a, a more energy renewable option and then they decide because of uh, economic conditions, they, can, they don't want to pay the extra for that option. They want to go back to the default. Can they do that in January? Or if the town wants to change to something different in January, can we do it? I don't know. The, the, the Q&A wasn't clear. It says once you opt out of the program, it's up to them to let you back in after a few months. But, yeah, I, um, actually, I can't find him. So okay. um, and would you say again what your question was? <clears throat> if, if you take the, any option right now, whether it's default or anything, any of the other three, Come January, you want to change that option. Can you do that without opting out of the program and then asking them to get you back into the program so you can pick a different option? Okay. Just want to make sure I understood the question. I think Nat went off for a bike ride. But okay. if he comes back during our meeting, I'll, I'll grab him. He, I think someone has asked him that question, um, and more than one. And I think he knows the answer, okay. but he's not here right now. Okay, so when he comes back, I'll, I'll, I'll grab him. Um, my understanding is you can change within the options we have. 
Right. Um, but if you uh, opt out, then you might have to wait to come back in. Right. So I don't think you, I, I, my understanding would be that, no, you don't have to opt out and then to, to change um, among the options we have. Okay. Well, but I, I, I want to make sure I would like to check that with Nat. Right. I, I didn't see that discussed anywhere in their Q and A's or on their site. So, okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so we need to take a, a yeah. make a decision on, yeah. on well, I move that we use the default option for the town's electricity. Okay, I'll second that. Motion, all those in favor, Joyce? Aye. Fred, yes. Okay, moving on, the next item under all business was discuss next steps for planning the future of the center school and possibly set a date for the center school visioning committee presentation. Well, I guess we, I had hoped that I guess Jonathan would be here because we need to make some kind of uh, decisions how we're going to proceed on here. And I said I had some, or I had a proposal I guess I could make uh, on how I think we should proceed. We can still, we can still have a presentation from the, from the committee that wouldn't commit us to, to anything. We would just hear what they're their uh, report yeah. was about, and I guess people online could, could see that. We, we could still proceed with that without taking action how we're going to plan for this in the future. Yeah. And I would not want to sign on to any plan for the future without hearing from right. them first. Yeah. Right. So if I, I guess if they want to, if the committee wants to make a presentation, I guess maybe I'd ask Brian if to schedule it either next meeting or meeting after. D depending on what other items we have on the agenda and kind of limit it to 15, 20 minutes. Uh, I mean, I, I've seen their PowerPoint presentation, I, I guess, and, and we could go on for a half hour plus if we wanted to do all of that. Uh, I think right now for, for at least, the, I guess, select board and people watching, the shorter version is, is more appropriate. And then later on, comes to what the town plans are doing, or if we need to get more input, we could do a, a more lengthy version later on. Mm -hmm. Well, I, yeah, I, I don't particularly want to limit them. If it's, if 25 minutes would, would mean they do a better presentation, I, I don't know if I want to limit well, it too much now, because this is, for me, this is, besides reading the little article that they put in the scoop a couple issues back, this is really my first chance to talk to anybody who was there face to face about what all the different options are that they that they learned about from people. So I, I just I, I hesitate to to put too strict a limit on it, but because they did a lot of work. Um, yeah. and I think we should hear them out. Yeah, I hear what you're saying. I was on a committee and attended I guess Yeah, I know. So for you only need the short version because you've heard it all before. I mean but, people who haven't been up on it, um and have say only gotten the information that was published in the scoop that went to everybody's house. Maybe uh, the, you know, if they have a longer version and it's only five or ten minutes longer, then then that's um, then that's fine. It might be they only have a twenty-minute version anyway. So. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So okay, I guess I'll leave that up to Brian to figure out when would be the best time for them to to do that, and then we can, at that meeting or. or or after that, we can talk about what our next steps would be for that, so, okay. Okay, moving on to new business. Uh, we talked about Poplar Hill Road. Uh, next yes. is to consider entering a lease purchase agreement for a rubber tired excavator. I guess I'll ask yep. Keith uh, to, or Brian comment on that. Yeah, I'm just wondering, Keith, do you need anything else on Poplar Hill from the board? Or are you pretty much all set? No, I, I think I'm all set. I, again, I just wanted to make that determination on the width because there was, you know, questions in about it. And, mm. and I feel that's certainly within the realm of the, that road and the vehicles that mm. are using it will be fine. Okay. 
Okay, yeah, I, I agree with what you've decided to do there. Yeah, I have no problem with that. Yeah, that seems, and you, you, uh, with the meeting material you sent us, it, that kind of really backs up your 20 foot decision uh, yeah. over the 18 foot decision to me. Okay. I think, Brian, you have the everything that we need to talk about for the excavator, the paperwork. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Um, so we have the lease purchase agreement. Um, it's in the meeting packet. Yes. Um, yeah. There we go. It would be to purchase the excavator. Um, so it would be five years of payments at um, $37,297.49. First year is coming out of Chapter 90 funds. And then we have four additional payments that will be made after that. Um, and these would be appropriations that will be voted on annually at the annual town meeting. Um, okay, that's not the stuff that says State Bank at the top of the... Yeah. Oh, it is. That yeah. is the, that's the bank that's financing it. I thought it was coming out of Chapter 90 money. That's... That's how the town is paying the leasing company. Okay, so the leasing company uses, okay. All right, got it. Yeah, I gotta have a middleman to collect up some extra fees, I guess. But the, the rate was just over 3%, so it's, that's pretty, you know, pretty good in this day. Yep, no, I, I, I agree, okay. I understand then why it's got the name of a bank on it and not the name of, I, I don't know, whatever the, uh, Lease. They didn't seem like the place that would lease these sort of things. This this company is the same one that we are paying using for the boom mower that is done through mm -hmm. Eversource, and also um, we'll be planning on the same one we use for the chipper. Okay. okay. Alrighty. Understood. There's a lot of fine print there, which I assume Brian yeah. has gone through with a tooth comb. I right. went cross side. <laughs> chapter nine, chapter nine, using chapter ninety funds that we only agreed to for this year, right? right. Correct. Every chapter. every year we'll address it. Right. Yeah. Every year we're deciding what fund to use to pay for it. Okay. Yes. So we're not committing chapter ninety for five years. Correct. Right. Not at this time, right? Not at this time, right? Okay. Keith, are you submitting the invoice? Yes, I, the invoice has been submitted, and I don't know whether either Catherine or Daryl will will process it, and so it will be on the next warrant. So I know the first payment, the date is written that it's due at the time of closing. So I guess that I'll let that be up to to somebody at the town office to figure out that. Yeah, I should have the check on Monday. And seeing you've already approved it, I could probably release it before the warrant is signed. Um, and then we can send it in with the signed documents if that works. It, that's fine with me. You just hand, deal with that with Brian, I guess. Okay. okay. So then you would get it shortly after that? Yeah, the, the paperwork. I mean, the, the machine is in the yard. We've been using it. Oh, okay. We, we had started off with, by rental. Okay. I'm just curious, you, you've been buying some equipment that you need, like the excavator, the uh, wood chipper, and maybe something else. Do you have a, a covered place or a sheltered place to store this equipment? Um, you know, at the, at the moment, the, certainly the, the chipper um, doesn't need, you know, in the summer months, the chipper can go in the salt shed and the same thing with the, the excavator, it can, we can put that in the salt shed. Um, as far as other options, one of the place things that I work sometimes with John is the high tent that the, is in the back of the fire station. That's an option to put it in in the winter time. So we have, we have some options to keep it out of, you know, so that it's not out 100% of the time. Right. Okay. 
So do we need to take any action? Um, yeah, actually, if you'll entertain me for a minute, I should probably read this resolution. It's, it's part of um, what we're going to Fred ask you to sign, and it's going to say that the board has passed this resolution. So okay. I'll read it quickly if you want. Okay. It's actually exhibit D of the agreement. Okay. Um, it's, it says, uh, be it resolved by the governing body of Abogor as follows. Determination of need, the governing body of Abogor has determined that a true and very real need exists. That's kind of dramatic. For the acquisition of the equipment described on Exhibit A of the government obligation contract dated as of July 10th, 2020 between the town of Waitley, Massachusetts, Abogor, and KS State Bank Obligee. Number two, approval and authorization. The governing body of Abogor has determined that the contract substantially in the form presented to this meeting is in the best interest of the Abogor for the acquisition of such equipment. And the governing body hereby approves the entering into of the contract by the Abogor and hereby designates and authorizes the following persons to execute and deliver the contract on Abogor's behalf with such changes thereto as such persons deem appropriate and any related documents, including any escrow agreement necessary to the consummation of the transaction contemplated by the contract contract. And I would suggest that the authorized individual be the select board chairperson. Um, and then three is adoption of resolution, uh, resolution, the signatures below from the designated individuals from the governing body of the Abogor evidence the adoption by the governing body of this resolution. There. Okay. And so you uh -huh. see you can put in select board chair there for the authorized individual so that when that rotates through each year, and a different person has to is authorized, I guess. Does that matter, or is it just we need it to um, be the, this year? We may just we would probably just put in a name there. I think. Okay. Uh, so yeah, with the understanding that this is the select board chair. Yeah. Okay, so we need a uh, motion to approve that. Yeah. I would uh, move that we um, uh, approve the obligator resolution exhibit D in the agreement. Okay, second it. motion, roll call vote, Joyce. Aye. Fred, yes. Okay. Then, I think, yeah, I think there would be a motion to, to uh, enter into the agreement with KS State Bank. Okay, I move that we uh, uh, enter into the agreement with, sorry, scrolling through. Uh, KS State Bank. Second. Okay. Roll call vote. Joyce? Aye. Fred, yes. Okay. Moving on. Uh, consider contract amendment with Sarah Campbell for additional services related to Chestnut Plain Road sidewalk project. So this is this is money that we have appropriated. Um, it's just we hadn't amended the contract yet for her to do the construction oversight of the complete streets project, the sidewalk yeah. construction project. And a small amount of this, I think it's, um, it's either eight, I think it's $900. She did some additional design work to the south of Haydenville Road, right? I think that's right, Keith, right? Yes. Um, and that will allow, um, if there's money left over to allow some of the work to continue mm -hmm. down. Uh, Chestnut Plain Road. Okay. So that would maximize what we have in the grant. Right. Just to you know, explain a little bit more. Like Brian just said, I, we don't want to. Or first of all, we were given a certain amount from the state, and we don't want the project to come up and say, "Okay, well, we are given twenty thousand dollars back. We want to spend everything they gave us." So this will sort of enable use. us to go as far, you know, basically on a linear foot until the money's run run out. Okay, and that's assuming your bids come in under the estimate. Correct. All right. Correct, and so there's, there's wiggle room in there taking that into account. And so if the bids come in high and we can't do any of this, well, it, it is what it is, but for the little additional money to spend to have the you know the design to go down that section and it's um, going right on the existing location. There's no discrepancy as far as 
moving it or anything of that nature. It's it's very, very straight and headed down towards the church on that west side. Mm -hmm. okay. And as, as far as uh, inspecting the work done, if some reason it doesn't get done, then we wouldn't have to pay her that amount. Yeah. Uh, I, go ahead, Keith. I believe that we would be paying her that additional money because we've asked her to, to do that design. But we would have the design done. But you said and also. It's something we can build on for when the next phase, whenever yes. that happens. And what was the amount? 800? I think it was nine, 900. Nine, okay. Okay, but the, the remaining amount was for, for construction with oversight or whatever. If some reason this doesn't happen, are we correct? Right. Are you obligated to pay her that amount as well? No, not if the work's not done, no. Not if there's work done, okay. Okay, so we need to take an action on this. I would move that we um, approve the contract amendment um, as written here. Okay, second. Roll call vote. Joyce? Aye. Brad, yes. Okay, moving on. Uh, consider contract amendment for time bond for required water quality monitoring at the Williamsburg Road Bridge project. And I think this is coming from the what, Conservation Commission to protect the uh, Northampton DPW water system. Correct. That the outcome of the our notice of intent in filing with DEP and working with the city of Northampton is um, having maintaining water quality testing and controlling. And so it's going to be a fairly, you know, drawn out in the aspect that it's not something that just happens in one day. So during the whole project, anytime water is being, you know, dewatering out of, out of the area they're working and they're pumping it into the, the methods that they're using to filter out the, the solids. Somebody has to monitor all that. Um, and so that's what this amendment is with Ty and Bond. Okay. So is this actually going on now or soon when, when you're, I, I, at the moment, I can't tell you the exact date they're looking at starting other than we've had our pre-construction meeting. Um, I just, at the moment, I can tell you that every, they're just trying to line up all the apples and get everything in, in, in line and, and then begin. Okay. At, at the moment, the, the other thing I can tell you is the completion date is the end of right around Thanksgiving, the end of November, barring anything that would give the contractor a reason to get an extension, but that's where it stands now. Okay. And, and we have money in the, uh, in this, for the, in this project account to cover this, this cost money we got from the state. Okay, they make a motion. We approve. I'll second that. Contract amendment for time bond for $12,000. I'll second that. Okay, we'll call vote. Joyce? Aye. Fred, yes. Okay. Uh, moving on, town administrator updates. Ryan? I can do long ones because Jonathan's not here. Yeah. <laughs> Well, these are probably short ones, so he'll he'll be sad he missed the meeting. Right. A yeah. um, couple updates on the uh, the marijuana establishments that have, that have permission in, in town to operate. Well, Tober they um, they don't have their final license. They don't have their license yet from the CCC. And their attorney contacted me the other day and said, "Oops, our host community agreement has." has lapsed because it's been over 18 months. It's been about 19 months. Um, so, and he asked me to get in, in contact with him. I posed the question to our town council as to how the best way to proceed is, and I haven't heard back yet. But mm -hmm. that's something we'll be looking at in terms of 
um, how we address that moving forward. Right. Or do we, we don't have much to lose by just saying, sign that same agreement again. It's very similar to what we've been doing to others. Yeah. I mean, it just took longer than a lot longer than 18 months. Yeah. And they have a, I think they have a good excuse for, they have, yeah, stuff happened the past couple of months, right? That yeah. Yeah. Kind of delayed things. stuff. What, yeah. Um, what, what location now is this at, Brian? That's the uh, the one at the Sugarloaf Shops. Sugarloaf Shops. Now, don't we have another one south of that that's not expired yet? Yep. She's also working on trying to get her, her license from the CCC. Okay. You're talking about uh, Shine Diamond uh, Shine. Shine, Diamond Shine. Diamond Shine. Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, she's also working towards getting, yeah. her, getting her license. The okay. CCC has not been... Uh, I should I should not make comments, but it hasn't been a quick process for a lot of people. Yeah, I know. I understand that at one point she was emailing to me that, and uh, they the cannabis control commission folks emailed back to her that she was number six in line for whatever the next step was. So I wouldn't be surprised if we heard from them. I don't know how long it takes them to get through six applications, but they were um, that's where she was. And so along those same lines, we also have the host community agreement for NAP advisors. That's the, the group that's proposing cultivation at Full Bloom on the corner of um, State Road and Christian Lane. Um, I just received notice that their application is complete at the CCC. Um, so now it'll start the review process. I don't know exactly how long that will take, but it's, it's a step in the right direction for them. And we have an active agreement. Well, maybe we don't. I'd have to check that in terms of the first one we did with Urban Grown. Um, that has probably lapsed, but I, I really haven't looked. Um, so um, changing topics, um, there was an ad for, to fill the highway position. I think we have somewhere between 20 and 30 resumes that we've received. Wow. And, Keith and I will will uh, hopefully look through those, see which the what the prime candidates are next week, and try to move towards uh, filling that position. We're just wondering: does do you have any preferences as to whether we hold those interviews in person or via Zoom? In person, socially distanced meetings, interviews, um, mm. as opposed to Zoom. Any thoughts on that? I would leave it to you and Keith. I mean, I don't know when you're interviewing for, I mean, a position requires some physical strength. And I don't know if that's part of the interview that you can evaluate that kind of thing. Um, if you could evaluate it on Zoom or if you have some other way to indicate, yeah, this person is not, is got the, you know, maybe yeah. from their previous employer, you might know that they, uh, that, so I, I guess I don't feel like I have any expertise to to lend on that. So I would leave it kind of to you and Keith, but maybe Fred has some no, I, idea. I, I, I kind of agree with you, Joyce. I leave it up to, to you, Brian and Keith, uh, whatever you think. If you want to meet in person to see the guy and that gives you a better impression or helps you decide, fine, go for that or or limit it down to three or five or whatever you think are the best qualified and and, and, and go with them. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. in this case, there'd be the there's three of us and the applicant, so there'd be only four of us. And as Brian said, we can socially distance it, and I think yeah. that would be best. Yeah. yeah. Or if you know, if, if you have a, a bigger list, you just want to narrow it down using a Zoom meeting, and then just have your finalists in person. That that's, that's a possibility it, too. Yeah, but I think I think I would trust you to do that yeah. appropriately. Okay. Um, there's a couple grant applications that are coming up that I that I think are of interest to us. One is the what's called the Meta Grant, that's the Municipal Energy Technical Assistance Grant. And that's through uh, DOER, and that's where DOER will will hire a third party um, to do a detailed, a more detailed energy analysis of a building. Uh, one of the things that that we ran up 
well, we ran up against the coronavirus, but um, <laughs> when we were trying to put together a green communities application for the elementary school, we were trying to, we were having difficulty filling in the gaps from what UMass had given us, the UMass study, and then getting it to something that we could submit to green communities. Um, UMass, they kind of took the position that these are our recommendations and we're really not going to help you anymore. Um, and I certainly don't, and, and Jonathan doesn't really have the expertise to, to do the energy savings calculations or, or those types of things. Um, so I guess my hope was that uh, we could apply for this grant to, to, to kind of put a project together that we can apply for, for the Green Communities Grant. Um, one of the big issues that exists with the building and, and the Green Communities Grant is the Green Communities Grant requires weatherization first. So you have to prove that the building's adequately weatherized. Um, and then, then you can apply for upgrades to the boiler and all the other uh, mechanicals. Um, there's different ideas as to how to and what the best way is to weatherize a building, whether it's spray foam on the on the inner side of the roof decking, whether it's mm -hmm. trying to fill in, trying to add more um, insulation at the kind of the ceiling at the at the ceiling level. Um, and then there's mechanicals that are in the attic. So there's all all those different considerations as to what's best and the roof, uh, the cost to the spray foam roofing that we received was extraordinary. Because mm -hmm. um, there's just a lot of area yeah. to cover. Yeah. Um, but from kind of from a building operation standpoint, from at least what <laughs> the guy he was going to sell us a spray foam that has financial um, incentives for us to do that. But uh, even UMass said that from a building operation, from a building standpoint, it was probably best to bring those mechanicals into the, the building envelope. But it was really expensive to do that. Uh, so there's just we we'll kind of need some help to try yeah. to figure out what the best way to go is um, and help if we can get somebody else to pay for it, I think is the best kind of help. So, so a grant that will help us get the information we need to get a different grant that would actually make the improvements on the building, whatever the best strategy was, would be determined. Right. So but I think, I mean, how, yeah, yes, yes, let's apply. So, I don't think you need us to vote on that, right? No. <laughs> Brian, are, are you looking for somebody to help you fill out or con condense or, or evaluate this information for the application for the grant? The, well, the, the one that the meta grant that we're talking about is, is, a, is pretty simple. We would say we would want somebody to take the UMass study, which is kind of the thousand foot level and yeah. tell us how to actually do it and do it right. Cause they give us a lot of options and it would be nice to have sort of a neutral third party say, look at all the options and say, this one is, this one's the best and this is what the costs are. Yeah. I got a question for you. Well, so that's what this grant would be is to get a third party to help you evaluate all the options. Yeah. Now, is, is this something that, Mass Save would help us on. Did they get into that? Um, it's 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 more detailed than the map than Mass Saves would, and it's more detailed than what Mass Saves would provide us in terms of a energy assessment. But as far as evaluating the options, would Mass Save help us do that? Not at the level that this would. No. No. Okay. And if you don't get the grant, then what's what's the next step? Are we going to do anything, or? Um, I would I would hope that we would figure something out because each year we don't apply to me seems like yeah money that we're not getting and that we should be getting because everybody pays. I mean, everybody's paying into the well, right. some indirectly, but everybody's really paying for this money to exist and. Yeah. Yeah, what roughly is the the size of the of this meta grant that we would be applying for? Like, how much would we be asking for there? I think the maximum is is twelve thousand dollars. 
and we'd be asking for about that about how much it would cost to get someone to help us um, with that analysis. Yeah, I'd want to I'd want to ask around and get some proposals as to. Okay. What that would be. All right. So you keep and, and do you know what the timeline is on this? Um, I think it's due in in the middle of August. It's due in August. It's decided. September, um, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They intentional they intentionally stack them like this so that you can get the this is the one time where it actually makes sense in terms of grant timelines, yeah. but yeah. you get the meta grant it helps you put together and it feeds into your green community's application that's due in late okay. January or February. Okay. Okay. So um, there's a member of the energy committee here who might be able to address Fred's question from earlier. Um, so um, Fred was asking um, if you um, are in, the, I don't know, let's say you're in the default program and in January you want to switch to one of the opt-ins. Um, yeah, you have to call the energy. You have to call them, but you don't have to like opt out and then wait to get back in. Right? No, you can just call them and switch. No, if you're, by default, do you mean the standard plan? The one that people get? The one that if you don't, yeah, if you don't do anything. You're in there. Right. Yeah, you can you can switch. Yeah. Yeah. It, it requires a phone call to do it. But if you decide you want to switch to one of the other opt in options or even the opt out option, you have to you have to place a phone call to do it. To oh. answer Fred's earlier question. Okay, yes. Yeah, that was a question. Okay. Because that wasn't clear in any of the literature. So Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean yeah, you're not the first person to ask that, I guess. Some people <laughs> might. Yeah. It's, it's not so much going up, it's maybe going down. If you picked a higher option first yeah. and then decided you wanted, you couldn't couldn't afford that for whatever right. reason and wanted to yeah. drop down to the default, can you do that without? Right. Yeah. Oh, there is, yeah, you can, you can do that at any time, but it takes a phone call. Yeah, okay. Uh, to do that. It probably takes a month or two for yeah. to switch you over. So. Right, okay. That's good to know, okay. Okay. Sorry for sorry for interrupting the town administrator updates. That's all right. Yeah. We're all about gathering information here. Yeah. Um, there's also another grant opportunity that came out. It's called the Shared Streets and Spaces Grant. Um, this is due in September. And it, they claim to have a really quick turnaround. Um, and they're trying to spend money um, to improve bicycle bicycling and pedestrian improvements um, that support economic de economic development or the reopening of, of businesses and spaces um, in relation to COVID-19. I'm not exactly sure where the source of money is coming from, uh, but that's also another great opportunity we're gonna look at. Okay. Uh, Keith and I are gonna look into that a little bit deeper. But again, it's another opportunity for um, free money that doesn't have a match. Um, so mm. I'll take a look at that. Um, is changing topics. So the, the Board of Health has been, the Boards of Health of the four towns um, have been working together to try to um, set up some regional flu, uh, flu shock clinics, not flu clinics. Um, for flu vaccine clinics, flu shock clinics. Um, and the idea is that uh, they're hoping to use these flu clinics as a dry run for hopefully when a uh, coronavirus vaccine comes out, that they'll kind of have, I, I think there, there's two reasons for doing it. One is there's a hope that there can be, uh, that the flu shock can come out a little bit earlier so it would free up manufacturing capacity for um, a COVID vaccine once it comes out. So long story short, they're, they're aiming to do flu clinics, one um, at the end of September. I don't want to say the exact date because I'm not sure it's set in stone, but it would be at the senior center. Um, so it would be uh, a flu clinic at the senior center at the end of uh, September. And then they would be doing um, a second one sometime likely early October. Um, and that would be for, um, I think it's for more of, well, it's not just for seniors, let's put it that way. 
I think they have their priority groups as to as to who they want to target, uh, and that would be sometime uh, towards the middle of uh, towards the beginning of October, and that's something that the that the Board of Health is coordinating. So we'll have more information coming out about that. Um, oh, good. We used to have all the time. We had a drive-through one at Yankee Candle once. Yes. Yeah. That was, um, and they had last couple of years they haven't done it, but. Um, yeah. Uh, but I remember when the flu shot was less uh, ubiquitous, the, it, it was like, oh, there's a chance I can actually get the flu shot. Otherwise, I couldn't get it that year. So I'm, I'm, all, I'm all over this. I think whatever we need to do to support them on it is good. Yeah, I think, I think the discussion is that there, I, I think Waitley's going to join Deerfield and it will probably, I think there's talk of a Deerfield Highway Garage as a drive-through site. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, that's a nice big site. Yeah. There may, may be one in Sunderland, but I'm not positive. Uh, Do they have, or even, the, works. even the Yankee Candle site? I mean, you got. Yeah. Oh, I, I might be confused. It was the um, industrial park, wasn't it? I got the site wrong, I think, but yeah. No, it was at Yankee Candle. It was at their, their store location, I think. Oh, oh okay. I remember, but I mean, you, you got plenty of parking and if people are going to line up, I mean, you need to have a place, you need uh, to, I guess, safe off the street yeah. to park. I think they're both going to try to be drive through. Um, right. Well, even drive through, you're going to have people lining up to get through. Right. Lining up. A little line of cars. <laughs> line of cars, keep them in their bubbles. Yep. Um, so I just wanted to get that out there for people to have it on their calendars. Um, okay. Oh, good. Good. I'm happy to hear that. That's about it. Mm. Well, then, uh, may I uh, move that we adjourn this meeting? Okay. Second. All those in favor? Joyce? Aye. Brad? Aye. Okay. With our next meeting is uh, what, July 29th? Yep. That would be our next regular meeting, yep. Next virtual meeting. Okay. See everybody then.